lecture number four, and we will talk about setters, which is quite funny topic, quite interesting in my opinion, uh, because it opens a door to quite large uh, problem, which is called mutability. Maybe some of you already know about this because you are programmers, but I will still give you a an introduction to this problem and then we will see the code at the end of the lecture, the code of uh, Apache library and we will discuss the quality of it. So the structure of the lecture, uh, we talk about mutability, I introduced to the topic, then we discuss the problems of mutability, which kind of problems the, the mutability introduces, then I will show you some criticism for the object uh, relational mapping design pattern and as I promised Apache Commons email quite popular uh, Java library and in the end some recommendations for what to read and watch mutability so look at the code there are two pieces of Java code on the left side on the right side on the left side you see that they're both doing the same uh, the book class the book which um, encapsulates the title and um, on the left side, we see the code which has the setter, set title. It's a very common approach to design it this way. The method is called setter because it starts with a set, and then you set the title into the object book. On the right side, you see the same, almost the same functionality, but the method is not called uh, set title, like on the left side, like here, it's called with title. So we are, instead of changing the title inside the object, we create a new object. So look at this final modifier. So the book on the right also encapsulates the title, but the title is final. So you cannot change the title. You can only create a new, a new object. So look what happens here. You make the, 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 you make the book, like on the left side, the same. You make the book. And then instead of setting the title, you say from this book number one with title, create me the book number two. So basically we have two objects, the first one and the second one. You want to create another one, you create a third one, you create a fourth one. So you never touch the, the original one, you don't change it, it is immutable. So the left one, the object on the left one is mutable, the right one is immutable. And I will try to convince you today that the right one is better, even though it may look to you inconvenient sometimes because it creates new objects because it makes more objects than you have on the left side and performance wise definitely immutable objects in most cases are slower because they they need they require the virtual machine if it's java or the you know, whatever it is there the, the computer to deal more actively with the memory because they need to allocate more objects and to uh, the speed will go down but Many other things will go up, like maintainability, readability of code, quality of code, they will go up. And it's always a compromise, like I probably told you on the previous lectures. The quality of code, maintainability, the beauty of the code is always will be in a conflict with the speed. So if you want your code to work fast, then probably you will need to compromise the, the quality, compromise maintainability. You will need to do things which are not so beautiful. For example, static methods, which we discussed before. So you will need to use static methods if you want to work fast. Because not static methods, the objects and the methods inside objects always require interaction with memory. You need to allocate the object on memory, then you need to put the so-called virtual table in the object, then you need to go through so-called dynamic dispatch process in order to get to the method and, and do the work. In case of a static method, you just jump into the code without all this mess with the memory and just do what you need. So when speed is important, you of course cut corners, forget about object-oriented programming and just do static methods. But it will happen only sometimes. If you do it always, then you're going to get into big trouble. So you only do it sometimes when you really see, okay, in this particular case of piece of code, we need performance. So then we just put it probably in the documentation, like, look, we do the ugly thing here because that's the only way to do it, because it's extremely, extremely fast. I can give an example. I was working on some application maybe five years ago. We were doing the software in Java, which was uh, like commercial software, which was intended to be extremely fast because we were optimizing the speed of data processing. So we were creating a module which was processing tons of data in a fast way. And we did it in an object-oriented way, the right way, with all these beautiful objects and decorators and patterns. And then we, when we finished the first version, we put it into production and it was like 40 times slower than expected. 
So it was a complete like failure. So the project was absolutely non-discussable because it was extremely slow comparing to the expectations of the customer. And then we look close, closely what happened, why it's so slow. And we found that there, there are three pieces, there are three places in this large application which need to be optimized. So we got into these three places, we changed the objects into static methods, and boom, we got the performance right. So it was as fast as expected. But there were three places where we actually compromised the design. And that was explicitly documented. Here the design is bad, but fast. So I think that kind of taught me the lesson that this is how it should be. So first you design everything properly with many, many, many objects. They all encapsulate each other. They're all immutable. And then you see what you get. If it's slow, then you decide where exactly I need to, to compromise. Okay, so now you see the first one is, the left one is mutable, the right one is immutable. However, I'm going to show you now that immutability is not as simple as, it's, as, it, as it looks. There are, in my opinion, four gradients or four levels of immutability. Constant, my names. I completely invented these names, so you didn't find them in the books, but still, that's what, I, that's what I feel about immutability. And I'll give you by example. Constant, not constant, represented mutability, and encapsulated mutability. M the names don't matter. Let's see what, what I mean by that. First one, constant. Look at this object on the left. The book encapsulates the title. The method title returns the title. I make an object, I put the title inside, nobody never will change it, it's a final, it's a constant. So no matter how many times you call the method title, it will return you exactly the same. Simple, right? It's completely immutable object. No, nobody can, you can, can modify it. That's easy. Let's go next. Gradient number two, not a constant. Look at this object. It also encapsulates the title, but look at the method title, which returns a string, but the string will be different every time I call it. So it is not anymore a constant. This object, look at the, the, the lines here, this one, and this one. So probably the result here and the result there, they will be different. Even though the object is immutable, no setters, I cannot set anything in there, but it behaves differently every time you touch it. It is also an immutable object, even though it may look to you like not so much of immutability, right? Because it behaves differently. So remember, immutable doesn't mean, doesn't mean constant. It could be immutable, still like this one, but the behavior is not constant. Its state is immutable, but the behavior is actually, you know, we can call it mutable. It, it, it behaves differently. But this is not the most complicated case. Case number three. Represented mutability, that's the name I suggest. Look at the class, it's a little bit longer. So it encapsulates, again, its private final, so no setters. I don't change the state of this object. I encapsulate the path to the file. And then I have two methods, the first one rename and the second one title. So I, I hold the title in the file. Instead of holding this in, in, in attribute, I keep it in the file on disk. And then I have two methods, rename and, so basically, write to the name and read it back. Write and read it back. So is this class immutable? I believe it is, because nobody, never, anybody can change the state. The location of the file, which is the state of this object, is immutable. It, it starts, it encapsulates the location of the file, and it never changes it. So during the lifetime of this object, Nothing changes. The content of the file, yes, it changes. But that's the mutability which happens outside of the object. This mutability is on disk, not here. So I'm the object, I'm an abstraction of something on file. And this something on file has its own life cycle, has its own behavior. I always point to this location, but I never, I never change it. I always be loyal to this location, so I never change that, uh, that place. So I represent a mutable something, a file. It's a mutable thing. I can give you a more interesting example, which I always give. Look at the, if you, if you write in Java, you can look at the, uh, at the class, which is called uh, java.io.file. This class is classic from Oracle, from, from OpenJDK, from JDK. Uh, this class 
is it encapsulates basically the path of the file and it has a method which is called size or length, I don't remember. So it returns you the size of the file. Every time you call it, it's going to return you a different thing. Or you can even, it has even the method delete. So you can call delete and then if you call size later, it's going to throw an exception because the file is gone. And if you look at the documentation of the file, you will see that it's called this class is immutable. It's an Oracle documentation. So they say the class is immutable. So we follow this paradigm, we follow this principle. It's, in my opinion, this is represented mutability. So I, rep I am an abstraction, I represent something which is mutable, and I don't care how it mutes, how it mutates, because I always point to the same location. Okay, and now the most interesting case, which is the most difficult to digest by, by regular programmers, is the gradient number four. In my opinion, in my name is encapsulated mutability. Look at the class. I encapsulate a buffer, a string buffer, not a pointer to the file on disk, but a pointer to another object, which holds the data in memory, which is mutable most probably. But I am immutable. So look, I have two methods, rename and title, the same as we had before with the file. Rename will store the information into the, into the memory buffer, and then the title will read from the buffer. So most people think that if the memory is mutable, then we just say, okay, it's mutable. But what is the conceptual difference between the file on disk and the piece of memory? In my opinion, it's quite the same from, from the perspective of mutability. The, the, the previous book example was pointing to the file, the file was changing the content. I can write there, I can read there, but I always point to the same location. Here, I point to some string buffer which stays in memory. It also changes the content, it also is mutable, but I never point to anybody else. I don't have any setters. So nobody can tell me, hey, please look at the different buffer. So, hey, we just inject into you a different buffer. It's the same buffer, the same piece of memory, but it is mutable. So it is encapsulated mutability. So I encapsulate something which is by itself is, uh, is, is changing what's there. So it, it is mutable. So it is impossible, in my opinion, not only in my opinion, to write code with constants only. So if you say, okay, my code is going to be immutable, so I'm going to use only this type of classes, constants then it's not going to work. You will not be able to work with the input-output, you will not be able, it's going to be extremely difficult. It's possible, you can write everything in completely constant object, but you will have to, it's, I don't imagine, I can't imagine, well, imagine how difficult it will be to write into the file, read from the file, so you will need to uh, invent some long, long, long uh, mechanisms of uh, re making new objects, new objects, will be, you'll, you'll have huge amount of objects for no reason. So, so I think these gradients of immutability, they are quite applicable to, uh, to good object-oriented programming. You just don't stick to constants, you just understand that mutability can be of different, of different gradients. Okay, that's, that's all about mutability, so now you understand what it is. Mutability, so far we didn't say anything whether it's good or bad, now I will say you why it's bad. What's wrong with mutability and why most, there, I, I give you a number of reasons now, not all of them, because there are many more and, and, and there are books about that, so I'm just, I'm just going to focus on just a few of them. First of all, I have to say that only the mutability of gradients 3 and 4, they cause problems, because if you do constants, then you will have absolutely uh, no problems in the, uh, in the code, but if your, if your classes are immutable like like uh, gradient three and four, then that stuff will be as close to. Will also be. Uh, will also need to. Will need special treatment. I'll explain now what I mean. First problem number one, which everybody point to, is called side effects. Side effects. I'll give you by example. Look at the code on the left. Uh, imagine we have a method called post. This method post uh, receives a request. Let's call it, let's, let's imagine it's HTTP request. Uh, it takes the request and configures it by setting the method post and then makes the request and makes the, you know, makes the connection to HTTP something and retrieves the data from there. 
So you know in HTTP we have methods, right? Get, post, all that stuff. So you probably know about this. So what my method here, what my code is doing here, it just accepts the object request, which is mutable in this left example. This is mutable. Here we have mutable request. So I take mutable request, I inject the, the string there, the method, I say, please use method post when you go to HTTP, and then, and, then, and then make the request. So how I use it here? I first make the request, make an instance of the, of the class, then I set method get, because I want to make a get, then I do post, and then I do get, because I expected to make a get. So I set get here on this line and here I use it but in the middle of this between these two lines I injected another line where I make a post request but I don't know exactly I don't look at the code I don't look at the body of this method it stays somewhere else I just don't know what it does I only expect it to not hurt my object but it will so I give it my object it does something with this object and modify it. I don't expect it to happen because I stay in this scope here. I just created an object. I injected some parameters in there. I configured it properly. I prepared it ready to use. And then I say, hey, you can also use it and you can also use it and you can also use it. And now I will use it. But it's completely broken at this moment, at this moment of time. This is called side effect. So when I call the method post, I don't expect this method to do something aside from the main functionality, aside from making the post request, but it does. It modifies the parameters, it modifies what I gave it to you. That's called side effect. The effect which was not expected, which happens, but I don't just logically don't expect it. And this is very you know, hurtful, for, hurtful for maintainability, for the code, because when you imagine I don't see this code on my screen, I only see this one. I look at it, I completely don't understand why this line makes also a post request. That would be a complete surprise to me. I created the, the request, I said make a get, then I do something, and then okay, make it, and it makes post. I'll be just like, what? And it's good if it's three lines, but imagine I have 30 lines, and I have no idea in which line this side effect will happen. Who else will touch my object? Imagine I, I send it to another method, this method send it to another method, then, and it goes, goes, goes somewhere, and, reach, and, 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 and that's it. But I still look at my code. These side effects could be extremely hard to debug. How you deal with that? You just make your object immutable. So if you pass it to somebody else, they cannot modify it. You give it to somebody, they give it to somebody else, they give it to somebody else, but who cares? Because there's, the object stays solid, the object stays unmodifiable, unchangeable. And then the problem is gone. This is exactly what happens on the right code, on the right block of code. So you see we have the same method post, the request comes in, and then we do, I don't touch it, I make a new request. Remember the method with. So I take the request, I call it with method. So here, basically what will happen will be new request. So a new object will be created. You sent me some object, I using this one, I make a new one which takes all the, all the state from there, modifies something, but I have a new one. But the original one is not touched. So side effect is gone, which is really good for maintainability. So instead of fighting with side effects, instead of writing documentation and saying, hey, please remember this method post will actually change the object which you sent to me. And, and please remember that it will change it this and that way. You just make your objects immutable. And boom, the problem is gone. Just don't let them use setters. So don't let, uh, don't have the, uh, the setters. Okay, problem number two, even bigger one with mutability is uh, the problem related to uh, thread safety. So how many of you know what is thread safety or thread unsafety? Okay, not so many. This is an interesting topic which you definitely will need to study later, the concurrency, the thread safetyness, thread unsafetyness. So the code may be executed in parallel. So you may have two blocks of code, three blocks of code, many blocks of code be executed at the same time. And this happens a lot in, in modern computers and in, in Java and in modern programming languages. We rarely use 
one single threaded execution, so-called. So we rarely just use run this and then this and this, this. Usually instructions, they go not one after another, but usually people in, in, in modern programs that people write, we usually try to put many parallel threads or processes or something like that. Why? Because we have many cores in our modern CPUs. And even if we have one core, still it's good to have multiple threads. Why? Because one thread, for example, starts and sends a request to the internet. And it waits before the, re the response comes back. And we don't want this, the whole computer to stop and wait. We want something else to happen there. We want some other calculations to happen at the same time while we are waiting. So in this case, we start two threads. The first one will go to the internet and wait for the result. Another one will, for example, show us some picture which draws some video on the screen and they go in parallel. So when you write code, you will need to deal with this concurrency. The problem is that the problem shows up when you start two threads and they start touching the same data. For example, you start two threads and this one goes to the internet to download something. And this one does exactly the same, goes to another place in the internet and the result which is coming back is stored into, for example, the file. And this one stores to the file, the same file. So who will store first is going to win, probably. So the file will be overridden and then in the end you will have only one result. So this is the collisions or... There are many types of collisions, race conditions, they call it collisions, when they conflict to each other. Conflict on data. So they conflict not on execution. They can run in parallel, they can do their own job, but when they start touching the same data, then the question is who will actually win? Who will write the data? So look at the code on the left. It's extremely super simple. The class books, there's a one internal counter, C, and one simple method, add. So I count books. I can call add, 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 and every time I call add, it's going to increment the internal counter. Super simple code. Look at the code on the right. I mean, not many, many of you, maybe not all of you understand what it does, but I'll explain. The first two lines, we just create a number of threads waiting for execution. As I said, the thread is like a place where the code works. Like you have, you start with the main thread when your Java or any application starts. You have one sim single thread, which is the main thread. And then from this thread, you can start, you know, forking and you start having more and more threads. So here we start so-called a pool of threads. It doesn't matter how internally it works, but then we make uh, uh, an object books and we add 1000 threads to the pool. So I am telling this, this 1,000 threads, execute this code in 1,000 parallel lines, parallel threads. So do it in 1,000 at the same time. So start 1,000, let's call it execution processes or threads, whatever you call it, and each of them will start, well, in this particular example, it's not going to be simultaneously at the same time, but imagine they all start at the same time. All 1,000, so the CPU, the computer, will just give control to these threads one by one. You start, then you, then you, but it, it, it's done on the level of the CPU, so it, it looks to us like it's parallel. Or maybe imagine the real computer with 1,000 CPUs, 1,000 cores, 1,000 processors. And then all of these 1,000 processors, they just start at the same time, and they all try to do the same. They try to increment the number in memory. Increment. One, two, three. If they will go consequentially, one after another, sequentially. Then the result, I'm asking this question, what's going to be the result? The result will be 1,000. But they do it parallel. They're not going to do it at the same time. They will do it parallel. So what will happen? The result will rarely be 1,000 here. In reality, the result will be different. Why? What will happen? Every time you need to increment a counter in, the, in memory, you need to do one, two, three operations, three, three, three steps that the computer has to do three steps. Read the value on the, of the, from the memory, increment it and save it back to memory. Read, increment, save. Imagine we have two computers, two CPUs, and they at the same time read together, increment and write back. What's going to be the result? If it was zero, for example. The result will be one. It's not going to be two because they, at the same time, they took the zero from the memory, incremented to one, and they both have number one. So they save number one. Who wins doesn't matter. The one will be saved. 
Imagine the same happens with 1,000 computers. They all read zero if it happens completely at the same time, which rarely going to be the case. So they take zero, they all increment to one and save back the number one. But in reality, it's not going to happen like this. One of them will be faster, another one will be slower. So in the end, it's not going to be 1,000, it's going to be like 900, 700, unpredictable number. Completely unpredictable. You don't know exactly what will happen. You can try to run the code something something like this. You can start from this code and you will see you can experiment. It's really funny. It's really funny territory for for the study, the concurrence. It's very difficult. It's considered to be the most difficult uh, by many by many authors, the most difficult uh, domain for the analysis because unpredictability is extremely high. It's, sometimes you can you can spend days and weeks to debug the to, to find the bug of the concurrency when everything looks very reasonable everything looks clean very simple code but when you run it in multiple threads you get a wrong result what is the root cause of this problem is mutability imagine we put the the final modifier here so we prohibit this setting the value into the object then the whole problem disappears then 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 we will have to rewrite this code somehow because we will not be able to anymore call the method add. How we rewrite this code, that's a separate question. But at least this kind of bug we will prevent. So setters and, and, and mutability is the number one root cause of uh, concurrency problems, of these uh, conflicts, uh, synchronizations problems, and, and so on and so forth. And I would highly recommend you to take a look at this book, because I can tell you everything I learned about concurrency, I learned from this book. And it's quite easy to read. It's about Java, and it's well. It, it really well explains the problem. And concurrency is something you absolutely uh, must know and understand deep inside. It's not difficult if you understand like basic principles. What something of the principles I just tried to explain you now. If you understand the principles, you will be uh, very uh, very safe in there. And most people who I interview. When I try to hire people, like I had an interview really t two days ago, three days ago, the guy is Java developer for five years. And my question was about concurrency. Like, do you understand what will happen if this and this, like an example I'm doing now. And he said, no, I'm not really strong in the concurrency area, but I'm good Java developer. And it happens quite a lot. So people develop in Java and Java is extremely concurrent language. So Java is supposed to be you're supposed to use threads. You need to do concurrency programming. And if you, and if you don't understand what it is, then you're just you know, half a programmer. You know only half of, the, of Java. So this is the book, my recommendation. It's pretty old already, but still, I think, classic. Even though it's about Java, even, even if you're not Java programmer, just read it because it's, it, from Java it takes just a number of classes and shows you, okay, these classes, we use it this and this way. But you will understand the principle of semaphores, of threads, of these concurrency issues, of race conditions, many things which are uh, well explained uh, in Java. Okay, so if your object is mutable, then you are opening the door to concurrency problems, which are super difficult to fix. Of course, if you are smart, if you just, just develop a lot of tests, you can prevent them. But the easiest way, just make your classes immutable. And just, that's it. Forget about concurrency problems because it's not possible to change state by, by doing things like that. Again, it's a very primitive explanation, but you need to understand that setters and concurrency, two enemies. Problem number, number uh, three, temporal coupling. Uh, yeah. About the previous uh, concurrency problem, Major class immutable, but uh, here we have uh, constant immutability. Right. About the, uh, the first one. Uh, yeah. Uh, you modify the memory of the file. It also, class also will be, will be immutable, but. Yes, you're right, absolutely. That's what I said here. So, so these guys, so only the constant immutability, like you said, or not a constant also, that'll be okay. But uh, these two types, they will still continue to cause problems here in this example. So let's say, for example, you're right. For example, instead of, let's say we, 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 we call it final, but here instead of C, we will use a file, right? 
So if we use a file, then instead of just incrementing the number, we're going to write the value into the file, right? We still have the same problem. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So in this case, I would suggest to just go for constant and just say, okay, in this case, my class is constant, so you cannot change it. You can only make a new class from this, a new one. You want to increment, say increment, and we're going to return you new, 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 new instance of class books. Increment, we return you new, new, new. That, that's the way it is. And if you want to really use the, the mutability of uh, immutability with the, with the mutability inside, then probably you will need to synchronization. You will need some, some sort of synchronization. So you, synchronization is the solution for, for that kind of problems. So you basically, in front of the place where the data is changed, you put the barrier, you put like a door, and say, in this door, only one guy can enter. And when somebody entered the door, nobody else can enter until this guy leaves the door. This is called semaphoring or synchronization, whatever, just different names. But the idea is the same. So in front of my data, remember, remember threat safety or it's called threat safety. Threat safety means that I'm safe when many threats touch me. So this code is not threat safety. So if many threats will touch my code, then eventually something will, will fail. We'll, we'll, we'll have collisions. And... Um, so to, to make the code thread safe is to, in front of the data, put the door. And the door is usually used by semaphore. So semaphore is, is some, some, uh, uh, some programming uh, concept, which is usually provided by the programming language. So it's something which is done internally. So programmers just use it and it's provided by standard library or the language itself. And this semaphore is like a flag. So when you start modifying the data or when you read the data, you say, hey, I just took the data out. So the semaphore is like, oh, okay, we're waiting for you to return it back. You were waiting for your modifications. And then when you, when, you, when you write it down, then we again open the door and say, okay, now the data is modified. And now, so maybe I mix two concepts. There are locks and semaphores. So maybe lock is better. Maybe locking is, is more suitable here. So lock is like, there's the data. I, I lock it for me. And I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to modify it so nobody touch it. It's locked. The door is locked. Then I do my modifications. Then I save the new data and I unlock. So that's, but that's expensive. That's the problem. With locking, semaphoring and everything, it's expensive operations. You can do that, but that will take a lot more instructions of the CPU in comparing to just simple increment of the data. This line is very simple. Increment uh, by one, increment what stays in, the, in memory. Uh, it's much more going to be much more, it's going to be much slower. For example, in Java, in Java we have, it's a classic example, we have two lists, two implementations of the list. One implementation is, for example, linked list, and another implementation or a number implementation, a number of implementations. They are said, you know, what are the names? The, uh, the last time I was using it was like a few years ago. Concurrent, uh, right, Copy on write list, something like this. So a different implementation of the list. So you have two implementations of the list. The standard one, where you can put the elements there and the list just grows and you can delete elements and increment the list, just a simple traditional implementation and concurrent implementation. So the concurrent implementation, thread safety implementation, is ready to accept changes from multiple threads. If you just use the default list, and start injecting elements there from multiple threads, in the end, you're going to get something very unpredictable. Maybe some of them will be lost. And maybe some of them will be duplicated there. So something will happen which we cannot predict. And this is actually the biggest issue with the concurrency problems, that the result is unpredictable. So you will not see the error in most cases. You will just see very, very weird result. So you see the data which is completely unexpected there. So why, for example, in my list, I just injected 10 elements and I have only nine. And the, the, you will be not able to answer, to, to find this answer easily because clearly in your code, you have 10 times you, the data coming from the user. There are 10 elements, you inject them into the list and only nine of, nine of them there. But if you run this program again, there are 10. If you run it again, there are eight. So how, how you will, it's very difficult to answer the question of what's going on. You need to be really, uh, trained to solve concurrency problems. Yeah. Linked list is it's. Share the mode and like it's 
it is immutable, you're saying, in, in terms of what we discussed, yeah? Yeah, it's immutable, but it holds, uh, it holds a reference to the first element, and then this element holds the reference to another element, and that's that how it goes, yeah. It's not really, yeah, it, I would not say it's immutable. Right, right, yeah. So, so the point is that linked list is uh, uh, is is not ready for for concurrency. But the difference between link. So the question is now: Why should we in general use it if it's not safe? Why just let's just use the safe one? Always let's use the the safe implementation of the list in Java, and we will be safe, right? Everywhere. So let's just forget about linked list and just use the one which is provided to us, which is absolutely good for all possible situations. People don't do it because it's slow. Because linked list, the default one, it's fast. The, con the, the, the threat safety one, the, the, which, is con which is ready for concurrency, is much slower. So that's the difference. So you need to make a choice which one to use. You cannot always do threat safety because in this case you slow down your application. That's the, that's the trade-off between speed and threat safety. So most people, not most people, we mostly write thread unsafety code. And only when it's necessary, we write thread safety code. So thread safetyness is only by necessity, not by default. By default, we always write the code which is not ready for, for threads. And then we start seeing the bugs. <laughs> Usually this is what happens. Well, we, it's better to think instead of getting the bugs. It's better to, to think about what's going on and understand, okay, we have... We have threads now, so now let's take a look at our objects and make some of them thread safety because we touch them from different threads. But making everything by default thread safety is not a, is not a good solution. So thread safety is, is, like I said, is a problem. Problem number four, temporal coupling. Who knows these words? Maybe heard them. Okay, I'll explain. Temporal coupling. Coupling, you remember, right? We discussed that a few lectures before. So coupling is when two elements stay too close to each other. Coupling. It's like, you know, like in a family. A wife, and, and it's coming from there. So coupling. So there are too much, too, bound, uh, too strong bond between them. And that's not good. For programming, for family, it's good. For programming, it's not good. So in programming, when two objects or two classes know too much about each other, it's not good. Why? Because... This knowledge, uh, it makes it difficult to maintain this code. I touch this, I need to immediately touch this as well. Because it knows too much about me, it connects to me too, too much. And then these modifications need to happen together. What if the many of them are connected like this? I touch one of them, and then five others I need to, I need to also modify. And then it becomes the hell, the maintainability hell. I touch one piece of the software, and then many, many, many changes I need to touch as well. It's like a funny, a funny joke I saw on the internet some time ago, and I keep, keep remembering it. The story is like, it's like a video, video joke. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, it starts with the end, so uh, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you from the beginning. So the wife comes to the husband and says, I need you to fix uh, a lamp. And the, the guy just starts fixing the lamp. In order to fix the lamp, he needs the ladder. So he brings the ladder in order to climb up and fix the lamp. The ladder is broken. So it, it goes to the, to the garage to get a screwdriver to fix the ladder. It goes to the garage, the door to the garage is broken. So he needs to fix the lock on the door. So in order to fix the lock, he needs to go to take the car and drive to the shop and then, and then get some, some instruments. So he goes to the car, the car doesn't, doesn't start. So he goes under the car and tries to fix the car. And then the wife comes in and says, what are you doing? I asked you to fix the lamp. And he says, I'm fixing it. So he's actually fixing the lamp, but this is the, the dependencies. So there are so many dependencies between elements. This is the coupling. So the car is coupled with the door. The door is coupled with the screwdriver, the screwdriver with the ladder. So all these connections, this is exactly what happens. It's a joke for programmers, of course. So we programmers understand. This is what we do. So you probably know how, how it works. So you start with something and then you go down, 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 and you fix something else, which is seems to be relevant, but it's far away from your original problem. It's not good. This is, the, this is not how it should be. You should be able to fix one problem without being so much dependent on other problems. And this is coupling. Coupling makes this. So temporal coupling is also a trouble. Look at the code on the left. Uh, 
look at the code on the left. So we do, I create a request. So let's say I'm trying to make a request to the web. Then I say, okay, please use the method post. Then I uh, fetch, uh, make, the, make the post request. Then I change the body of the request. And then I make another request. So here at this line, I expect that post is already there. So on the last line, I expect that this configuration line happens somewhere up. Because the last line will not happen. I need this configuration to happen up. But the distance between these two lines may be quite large. So I get the object. The object is mutable. So I injected something in the object. And then life go, goes on and I end up and I, and, I, and I end and I finish with some line which has a lot of expectations about these configurations which supposed to be happen up. So this is the coupling, temporal coupling. So I need this to expect, I need this to happen before my line happens. So I depend, temp, I depend by the time. So before you call the last line, you need to remember that this line should also be called. And this, this memorization of this is completely out of control of the compiler. So compiler doesn't know what's going on. The compiler cannot help. The, the compiler will, if let's say, I, like in this example, let's say I remove this method and I remove this method because I say I don't need to make this request, the first request. I only need the second one. So I look at this code, at these two lines of code, and I see, you know, uh, uh, I don't need the post to happen uh, I don't need this first request because my, my requirements changed. I just don't need it. And I say, okay, these two lines I can safely remove. But no, hold on. The first line cannot be safely removed. This line is important. For who? For this guy. How do I know? I don't know. Who can give me a hint? Nobody. The compiler cannot anyhow suggest me like, hey, you cannot remove that because remember this injection, this set method or whatever, just there are not setters here, but set this, this modification of the object that happens many, many lines before actually is required for this and this and that. If the object would be immutable, that would not happen because you modify the object, but then you use exactly the modified version. So with the, with, the, with the immutable objects, this problem completely goes away. And this is a very typical problem with the temporal coupling. Again, many authors, some authors write about this, and I, I saw it many times in my life, especially when the, the code is large. When you look at like a hundred lines of code, it's hard to understand whether the line, what's happening here is actually necessary for, for this. You're lucky if you have unit tests. So you can run, you remove the line, and the, the unit test will say, hey, something happened, something is better. What if you don't have unit test? The compiler cannot help you anyhow. So temporal coupling is absolutely, again, the source of this problem is mutability. Get rid of mutability, you don't have temporal coupling. You always use the object which was created somewhere. You use it here. If you remove the preparation of the object, the compiler will fail. It will say, hey, the missing, the object is missing. So what you build is what you use. But it's not like I, I build it, I inject it, then somebody use it, and somebody else is use it. I mean, this mess is going to go away. Okay, this is temporal coupling. Let's go next is the last one, the last problem. There are many more, not many, but a few more, but this is the last uh, for you to know today. So-called identity mutability. It's a funny problem, which exists in Java especially, but many in other languages as well. So look at the first, or the, on the left, snippet of the code. I create the date first, and the date second. Date is a mutable object in Java. It's a classic mutable object. I can create a date, and then say set time. So I can inject the value into the date. The date is created, but it's not solid, it's not immutable, you can inject time, no problem. The object stays the same, but you inject the time in there. Ugly design. In my opinion, the ugliest place in Java design. Why they made it this way, I don't know. Why they make such a small, such a primitive object like date, making it, immut making it mutable. I don't know, but this is what, what we have. So, what we do? We do first date, second date, but if you compare 
uh, first and the second, you will see that they are not equal. So it's okay. You modify the second one. When you ask them compare first and second, they say false. And now look at this code on the right. We create a hash map. In the hash map, we... And hash map, you understand what it is, right? It's just an associative array where we have the key and the value, key and value. And then we make a date. And then I put uh, an element, in, not, I, do, I put a pair into the map. The key is my date and the value is hello world. So far, so good. And then I say date set time. So I inject into this date. I inject a different time. And then I ask my map, do you contain this key? And I'm going to get false. All of a sudden, you don't expect that to happen, right? You're just like, how come? I just injected to you. Why false? It is there. Why it is false? I can explain what happens. Inside the hash map, they maintain some internal, internal data, internal you know, mapping of what's going on. And some internal, internal map. When you inject there, it goes to the key, which you gave it to, retrieves from the key the unique ID of the key, which is generated by, by, uh, generated by the date using the internal information. It retrieves some number from there and says, OK, number is 42. OK, I'm going to place you by number 42 in my internal database, 42. Then you, then you modify this number in the date. So now if you ask this date, what is your ID? It's going to return not 42, but something else. So you come to the hash map and say, contains key, and you provide the date. The hash map goes to this key, to your date, and says, give me the ID. But it's not 42 anymore. It's 77. So it says, ah, 77, I don't have it. I have 42, which, which I got before from the date. When you injected to me, you were 42. When you check whether I, you are here, so you change your name. It's like you register yourself in the class, and they say, my name is Julia. And then I ask you, is Julia in the class? But Julia renamed itself already. So he says, no, no Julia in here. Like, how come? We just added Julia, but then the request, is Julia here? No, Julia is all of a sudden is Jeffrey. OK. So the so request for the Julia returns false. This is exactly what happens. So you change your name. You change your identity on the fly. And, and, and then you completely confuse the hash map. And not only hash map, there are other examples. But hash map is the most canonical example the traditional example people give. It's called identity mutability, not the name I invented. So it's it's pretty classic problem. Mutability of your identity. So you change your name on the fly. One time you're Julia, the next moment you're Jeffrey. So how can I, how the Java cannot be confused? Java will be confused. Many, many data structures will be confused. Why it happens? Because you're mutable. Remove this mutability from the date. Make it illegal to call set time. And the problem is gone. So by letting the objects, by letting these classes to modify their, their identity, their, their state inside, and because of the state, they also modify the identity, you basically open the door to uh, identity mutability problem. So objects then can start changing their names, their identities, every, anything. It's, it's hard to track. It, imagine this problem. Look, imagine you look at this code. I explain to you what happens, but imagine you, you get this, this code in reality and, and, and you get exactly this, like I add something to the map and the next line I check whether it's there, it's not there. How much time you will spend understanding what's going on? A lot, probably. You will debug and debug and debug and that will take, I don't know, hours before you realize, ah, this is what happens. Actually, it's a different, different object. It behaves, even though it's the same object for you, the comp for the compiler, it's the same object, but it's identity mutated between these two lines. It's, it may be as hard as concurrency problems to detect. And again, the source of this is mutability. So get rid of mutability, forget the setters, and you will, be, you will get much cleaner code. I have a question. So yeah. Uh, I've encountered this problem quite a lot, like uh, to the point where like, I don't really make this mistake anymore. But the thing that causes me the most is it's still the same object, it's still the same piece of memory, however, the links of this piece of memory, uh, we just grab the value, we just change it, for example, it's set time in here. 
how does identity change because of this political change of variety? Because, yeah, yeah, because that's a good question. Because in this particular object, in date, when, do you write Java? You understand Java? Yeah, so in Java, in order to understand the identity, we ask, usually this hash map will ask the, ask the method hash code. So Java will say, what is your hash code? And uh, in the date method, the hash code depends on the time. That's how I understand it. Maybe I'm just now may I'm saying, let me think for a second. But I think, yes, I think in date, the hash code depends on the state. Depends, so state is the, 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 the time. The, the hash code calculates, takes the time, does some processing and returns you the number. So by changing the time, you change the result of hash code. And if you change the result of hash code, everybody thinks it's a different object. So it's because it is the time as the actual time or because time is just a variable in the class? Time is just a variable, yeah. For, for, the, for the date class, time is just a variable, yeah. Just an internal attribute, internal field. Okay. So for example, we have the same class, just two instances of classes. Yeah. They have the exact same fields with the exact same values, but they won't be still equal, right? They will be equal because the same numbers will be in the values. Yeah, they will be equal. Yeah, they will. So here, look. So when you make, look at, again, let's see this code before the modifications. So let's see, see what happens here. First line, I create the date and number one is the time. I encapsulate the time. Then I create another object date, or another object date by the type date. Uh, it's called second, and I also encapsulate one. It's also time. So if I check whether they are equal now, after these two lines, the result will be true. One is there, one is there, so hash code is the same. The, the, the ID, the hash code will be exactly the same. It will be calculated the same. But when I change the time in one of them, then the result is now they're false. Now they're not equal. So they they calculate their hash code depending on the time, depending on the encapsulated field. This is how date works. Not necessarily all objects work like this, but date uh, does it like this. Yeah, I believe it's true, yeah. So, so basically when you do set time, you kind of, you think that you only change the state. But in reality, you also change the identity. In Java, identity is what hash code returns. This is how Java understands identity. So you check the, the hash code, you ask the hash code, and the number comes back. And this is for you more or less like ID of the object. In, not in all languages are like that. Some languages, the ID is ID, which is assigned when the object is created. So you make an object, this is ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and nobody can change it, never, ever. In Java, it's not like this. Java is more flexible, so Java can allow this mutability. Hash code, yes, yeah. It should use. You can do you can implement equals differently and then it will work differently. But in in this class it's the standard implementation. So when you call equals, it basically it just goes to one, calls the gets the hash code and goes to another, gets the hash code and compares. If the numbers are the same, it says okay. And it compares the type. So, of course, if you provide uh, for this equals, if you provide this parameter, for example, you give here, I don't know, file, then it will not try even to get the hash code. It will just say, no, wrong, file is not equal. But if, if it's date, if date is provided and the hash code is the same, just says, yes, it's exactly the same. So that's, that's the way it is. Okay, so this is called identity mutability. In my opinion, in my opinion, it's not a good idea. Yeah, in my opinion, it's not a good idea. Yeah, because you, because state and identity is different things. I think they should be different. But mixing them together like this, it's conceptually wrong. On state, yeah, on variables, yeah, yeah. In in this class, but you can design your class differently, and then hash code will not depend on the state. So hash code will be always unique. For example, like. Like we did in, in our, we designed our own programming language. And in our programming language, when you make an object, an object gets the ID. The ID is the number, and the number goes from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, as long as the program lives. The objects are just incremented, 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 and nobody can change that. No, the object itself cannot change its own ID. It's always a number which is uniquely assigned to the object, and that's it. 
So you can ask the object, what's your ID? And you get a number. And we guarantee, the language guarantees, the number is unique. So there will be no, no two objects in, in, the, in the object space with two exactly, with two, sim, with two identical uh, IDs. But this is our programming language. In Java, you're free to make whatever you want, which I think is not good for design, because designers make this stuff. They just uh, abuse the behavior of this hash code method. They take the, the, the data from the state, they manipulate with the state, and then say, this is my ID. But it's... Maybe they believe this is how it should be. Maybe they believe, okay, this state belongs to the identity. So they say, okay, it's a date. So date encapsulates only one long number, only just a number. So what else is there? Just a date. So why shouldn't we say that this is my identity? What's the point of separating identity and state if it's just a simple, a simple object with just date inside? It's not something complex. It's not like many, many fields. In this case, yeah, it's a different story. But they probably think this way. They just think, okay, it's the same, so let's get it together. I thought that equals is for checking equivalence, basically. Or equivalence is... It should be checked by others. It depends on what we mean by equivalence. What is equivalence in this case? So it's a... It's a it depends on what we define by this. So equivalence, usually people say this word when, we, when they say uh, that do two things behave equivalently. Behave. So there's a behavioral equivalence, so-called. Equivalent, be, equivalent behavior. So you behave like this and, and this guy behaves like this. You're different people, but you behave similar. So we say you're the same. You're, you're equally the same. For, for example, you're the student, you have a computer. He's the student, he has a computer. She's the student, she has a computer. So you're the same. You're equivalent for me, if I only care about who has the computer. So I say, this guy and this lady, they're equivalent for me, because I don't care about anything else, I only care about the property. Do you have a computer? The same for the date. Do we care about the type or whatever? We just care how it behaves. It behaves like a date, and this one behaves like a date. So it's the same stuff. So this is equivalence, yeah. But not identical, so you're different, pe you're different people, right? So you have one ID, student number seven, she's student number 17, for example. So you're different. But for me, if I check the behavior, you, have be you are behaviorally equivalent. That's how I understand. I think not only me, other people understand it this way too. So that's, I just listed you problems which are all coming from mutability. And now, interesting chapter about object relational mapping. Who knows what it is? Okay, you at least know the name, right? So object relational mapping. You will definitely uh, stumble upon this concept when you start programming because, uh, because we have so-called relational databases everywhere. Maybe you studied them already, maybe you will study them. Relational database. In relational databases, we keep data, let's put it simple, in tables. Tables and lines, lines and tables. Tables are some, somehow can be connected to each other by mentioning uh, the values in other tables. This is relational model of, of storing of data. In Java, we have, or in other object-oriented programming languages, we have objects, we don't have tables. So we have objects, 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 and we have fields, fields, fields. So many, people, many years ago, people asked the question, how can we connect these two things? So I don't want they, that's what they were thinking. I want to write in Java, and I don't want to know about relational model, I just only want to deal with objects. And, uh, and these objects must somehow magically connect to relational database. So what you have in the database, I want to map to my object space. So that's why object relational mapping. So what happens here automatically goes to relational database. What happens there automatically goes there. In my opinion, completely bad idea. Again, I'm, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating here, but I still believe it's a wrong idea. I'll show you a number of examples. And this idea is based on mutable objects. Everything is mutable in object relation, in ORM. Here's an example. Yeah, that's a slide, explains ORM stands for Object Relational Mapping, which is an attempt to represent relational data model in objects and relations between them. So what we have in objects, we have objects, attributes, fields, methods, inheritance, that kind of thing. And they have tables, foreign keys, SQL queries, that kind of stuff. Somehow we need to map one to another. How people do it? Here's an example. Java Persistence API, so-called JPA. Before JPA showed up, there was a library called Hibernate. Maybe you heard about it. Hibernate. Hibernate was 
probably one of the most popular libraries in Java world, maybe I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, then it, was, it became a standard. So initially it was just an idea made by some enthusiasts, they just said, okay, this is how it works, and then eventually Java adopted that and made an API, made an official API. So look at the code on the left. First, you define a movie. So, uh, yeah, I didn't show you the, the relational model. So in this case, let's say we have a table, which is called movie in the relational database, and it has uh, these columns, ID, name, and year. So this is my relational in, in MySQL, in Postgres, in some kind of Oracle database. In Java, I create this class, which is called class movie, and I have ID, name, and year. They're all private, they're all mutable, not final. And we have constructors, getters, and setters. All the full, the full package of, yeah, of all the beautiness is there, usually. Or you can make it not private, instead of private, you can make it public. But usually people make it private and because they believe in encapsulation, so they add getters and setters. That's what happens in Java world. So usually this class is long. I just show you the, 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 top, the, top, uh, the, the top part. So this is, as we now understand, this is DTO. This is data transfer object. It has no behavior whatsoever. It's absolutely dumb, anemic, no brain, just a, just a, just a, just a uh, data container with three fields, ID, name, and year. And now what we want, we want to go to the database, get the movie number one, change the title of the movie to the Godfather, and save it back to the database. That's what we want to do. How we do it? First, we get a so-called entity manager. It's a magic box which knows how to deal with, uh, with the database. Then we say, entity manager, get transaction, begin. So let's start a transaction. That's a language for database. So in a database, we call start a transaction. It's like a transaction is like a package of operations. So I start it, I do a number of manipulations, then I commit, and you apply these manip manipulations. You will learn it in the course of databases. Not, not important now. The next step I do, I say, identity manager, find by ID, and I provide ID number one. So I say to an entity manager, please go to the database, find me the movie, in the database, using the language of the database manipulations, retrieve the information you have, and create me the object of type movie. So basically, make me the object movie, inject there the data using setters, set, 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 and return me the data. Return me the object. This is what will happen when I call find by ID. Then I do movie set name. So I have this DTO. There is some name in there, injected before, so I look at this object and inject my own name. What was before, not important. And then I say, Entity Manager, persist. So take what I have and put it back to the database. So Entity Manager will see what I have. It will see, okay, probably the movie name is modified or something. It will understand what happened there, some magic inside, and it will create a database a query, and it will call the database and say, please update column number, blah, 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 and make all the manipulations which are necessary. For me, and then I commit the transaction. Transaction is done. So for me, for people who love object relationship or object relational uh, mapping, they will tell you that, look, the code is nice, right? It's so easy. It's so easy to understand. So I call the entity manager. I take the, okay, DTO, but I like it. It's DTO. I can easily change. I say set name. Everything is cool. Maybe it is, but uh, the biggest problem here is that, again, in my opinion, it's DTO, and the most, the biggest problem is that the, the object model is anemic. So we have one smart box which knows everything about database, and many, 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 many dumb objects, the DTOs, which are completely brainless, and we have some controllers which manipulate with the main, with the main guy. So we have main guy who talks to us using the language of DTOs, and we have some places of the code which are supposed to, to deal with this. So this is, I'm talking about this place of the code. So this is the code which is usually placed in so-called controller or some other place where the procedure, so this is the procedure which deals with the objects. So here I see no place for a real object which can encapsulate something, which inside has the behavior. So the behavior stays outside of objects. So objects are just containers of data, and behavior, this, 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 this logic, changing the title of the movie, is in some other place. 
and always the question, what is this place? And usually it's, this place is just many procedures which are absolutely not organized as objects and they are hard to, to maintain. My suggestion is, instead of doing this, in my opinion, ugly design, I suggest so-called, some time ago, I suggested, this is my turn, SQL speaking object. So look at this. Look at this code, which is, in my opinion, a bit better. So uh, this is the, the movie. So we have the object movie. I call it PG movie because it's Postgres movie. So it now knows that it is, it, it deals with a Postgres SQL. Postgres SQL, it's the name of the database. It encapsulates the source. So it encapsulates the, the connection to the database. Pay attention, it's final. It encapsulates the number of the movie. It, it gets this data in the constructor. And then we have two methods. The method number one is title. The method number two is rename. So I can read the title and I can change the title. Reading the title and changing the title. How do I read the title? What happens here, it's not so important right now. We're not going to discuss in details. If you want, you can learn it later. But the point there is that when I call title, the object movie connects to the database makes the, the proper SQL request, which is here, makes the SQL request to the database, retrieves the data and returns it back. So the, the functionality of connection to the database is encapsulated in the object, not in some entity manager, not in some procedure outside, but the object knows what to do with the database. The object is SQL speaking. It speaks the SQL language to the database. So when I want to uh, deal with the object, look how it happens. I have some interface here for the movie, but this is the real code. I see, I make new movie. This is, I provide the, the connector to the database, whatever it is, and different languages could be different thing. And I provide the ID of the movie. And then I say m.update. And this m.update goes in here, or update or rename, sorry, that's a wrong, wrong name, should be rename here. So I say rename. I, I call rename. The rename method will make a proper SQL request. Look, update, blah, 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 blah. It set the name to the database and, and that's it and finishes the execution. So no external entity here. I encapsulate the functionality inside an object. And this is always a, a, a virtue. It's always a good thing. It's a good design to make an object self-sufficient. It doesn't need anything from the outside. It can, re it, can, it can do whatever is necessary inside. And not to hold you too much on this topic, uh, I'll show you more complex uh, SQL queries, which uh, could happen. Let's say, for example, I have also movie, the same, the same class, it's called movie. And in this class, I have a method author. So the author is a more complex method. Why? Because it makes a more, a longer SQL request to the database. A larger one so it makes a join between two data between two tables so it joins two tables in order to find the name of the author by the ID of the movie whatever whatever so internally here in this method all the functionality is encapsulated everything is in there no need to rely no need to expect the entity manager to do this some people think this is bad some people will tell you we don't understand SQL I don't understand how to write this query. So some people may, may tell you, like Java programmers especially, they usually complain when I, when I was presenting that in a number of conferences before, a, a few people told me, I don't want to know SQL. I want some entity manager. I want to create DTO. I want to create this, this object with data and then give it to the entity manager and entity manager will do the magic for me. We'll do some combination of these uh, names and the SQL, SQL query, create the long SQL query and send it to the database. In my opinion, this separation of uh, the, the, the spread of knowledge is wrong. So it's not good that the object knows something about its own behavior and then some other place in the code knows something else. It's better to have everything inside the object. When I start to debug this, when I don't have when something doesn't work, I just jump into this method. For example, this method doesn't work. I don't know, the method author. So I want to know why the author is not retrieved as expected. I don't need to think about some magic which happens around the object. I just click the method, get inside, and I see exactly the query which goes to the database. It's all inside the object. 
and it happens because my object is because everything is my object is final the object completely encapsulates all necessary information and all functionality yeah uh, is it okay that our object knows nothing about the database itself? I think yes I think it's very good that the object knows about the database because in the previous example like this in the in the Java JPA they the object doesn't know nothing about the database the object doesn't have any, any behavior at all the object is just an anemic storage of three fields so in my understanding it's not an object it's not object-oriented programming it's just a piece of data but the idea of object-oriented programming is to put together data and behavior so that behavior stays next to the data together we need to see them together when I open the object I see ah this is the data and this is how you behave with the data what do I see here I go into this object I see nothing I see some ID year name what's next who and how modifies this data I have no idea somehow somebody from outside will do some setting setting getting how do I track that if I see this I just go in here and say oh I know how the author is retrieved I know how the data is used I know that the ID is used this this number is used here okay I know how this number gets injected into the query everything is in front of me yeah it may be more complex for the for the newbie programmer who doesn't know SQL but that's separate story I can show you in a second I can show you a practical example of the of the query who of you ever wrote SQL queries oh so you know you know the complexity of this I'll show you now a piece of code where you can see the yeah, the real complexity of uh, SQL and then you tell me whether any entity manager can do something like this I doubt it but we don't have so much time so now I'm finished with the slides so now I will show you Apache commons whatever now the purpose of this library written by Apache is to send emails so in Java let's say you want to send an email so how do you do this in order to uh, to make it possible to make the design for it um, Apache made a class which is called email the name of the class is email and then in order to send the email you take a look at the left this is the list of methods of the class set 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 update set get set get set get add 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 set 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 and the method send so you are supposed to call I don't know how many many you're supposed to call many setters on this object to inject a lot of a lot of a lot of data and then finally you call send which will take all these fields somehow combine them together somehow create the email and send it over if you want to let's say in the future if you want to extend this class let's say you're the developer of this library the only way to add additional functionality is to add more setters is to add more getters so this class is absolutely undecomposable it only can grow it can only be broken down into pieces because everything stays in one large piece of functionality and it happens because the class was initially designed as mutable so who first made the first setter actually introduced this large problem introduced the size of this class is about 2000 lines of code 2000 lines of code is un, in my opinion is unacceptable for object oriented design it's very difficult to understand what the class is doing and the biggest problem is that in order to, in, to increase functionality you can only in, in add new setters so basically this is not object oriented programming at all this is just a global storage of data and one procedure that reads this data so they didn't know what is object oriented programming they just know that there is in Java there are classes there are classes and methods okay we need a method to send an email okay where do we put the data we put the data next to this method we put all the data next to this method everything that the method needs we put in one place and the more the method needs the more setters we create I think a better idea would be to use object-oriented techniques like uh, uh, in cap like composition of classes like in cap like uh, the separation of concerns or whatever whatever they call it so that's uh, one large example of uh, of a problem so sometimes you may have this is an object it's Ruby it's a different programming language so this is an object which is SQL speaking object 
So it encapsulates the connection to Postgres. It encapsulates, and that's it. Well, it, it encapsulates us to supplementary objects. So basically, it encapsulates the connection to Postgres. And then I can say, for example, fetch, and it fetches me some, it deletes something, and then it, uh, yeah, it does some fetching. So it executes the SQL query. Or you can say deactivate. So it also does some, some manipulations with the SQL and uh, also executes some, some SQL query. And according to the result, it does something else, selects something else. What's interesting here, I can show you the size of the query it builds. So for example, this one, this is the method where I say query some, so return me or get me some campaigns, whatever, some number of campaigns. So it builds SQL query like this. See the size of the query. So it's a pretty large one. Imagine how difficult this model would be if I do it in objects instead of SQL. So SQL by itself, by, by itself, it's very difficult here. The logic is very complex. The logic is very sophisticated. So my idea, my understanding is that mapping this stuff to object-oriented domain is a completely wrong concept. So the complexity from here cannot be anyhow transferred to the complexity to the to this cannot be simplified anyhow by representing it in objects. I understand. So there are two completely different domains. That's why uh, getting trying to get them together is uh, just making it uh, just make it even more complex. So I again I cannot imagine how difficult that code would look if I use object relational mapping. That would be I don't know thousands of lines of code, so many objects, so difficult connections between them, expecting some entity manager to build this query correctly. And for me, looking at this query, I think understanding SQL is one story and understanding objects is a different story. And people need to know both, uh, both uh, techniques. So you need to learn how to build SQL query and you need to learn how to work with objects. But they are not they are not replacers. One does not replace the other. Maybe that's a little bit outside of the scope of this lecture, but just to illustrate you that uh, that ORM is not a good design pattern. I heard this kind of problem already. Some uh -huh. and some uh, people say that uh, in GPA or just GPC you can just specify the query, the text. The you can, that's right, yeah. That... They differentiate the DTO from, uh, they name it repository. Rep mm -hmm. So you have DTO and you have another class that can... And do this, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So they are saying that inside ORM we can do this sometimes when we need it, right? Yeah. When, when it's necessary we put this stuff. Okay, that's a, that's a fair point, I agree, but uh, I feel that people when they use ORM, they kind of trying to stay away from SQL. They're trying to not learn the SQL. They, 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 they expect this entity manager, they expect the engine to, 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 to deal with SQL in most cases. And, and that makes them lazy, makes them uh, unknowledgeable in this particular area. They cannot optimize the queries properly. They, they start forgetting what are, the, what are the foreign keys, what are the joins. Uh, data from uh, uh, queries. Mm -hmm. What is the, what is the argument of uh, uh, badness bad of spray? Because in our project we have only uh, queries like string, uh -huh. and we have no this uh, no DTOs, no entity manager, no entity manager. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I have some troubles with uh, that. I go to this file and there is a lot of uh, queries. Mm -hmm. But some people say that we can decompose it. So for each table, we have we have uh, our uh, list of uh, static methods uh -huh. <laughs> that contain all queries and return mm -hmm. our DTO. Contain. So the question is why we why shouldn't we? Yeah, why yeah. shouldn't we have yeah. this uh, this this feature? Yeah. I think it's more. Of course, we can. We can have this, we can have that. Everything will work. In this case, it will work. In your case, it will work. In their case, it will work. So I cannot say, I cannot make an argument that something doesn't work, so that's why you shouldn't use it. It's a question of maintainability, the question of readability. Which, kind, which code will look better? Which code will be easier to understand? 
I think that mixing two concepts, mixing two paradigms together, will make the code less readable, less understandable. We have relational domain and we have object domain. And trying to put them together, trying to interleave them somehow, will only lead to, um, to misunderstandings. To misunderstandings, like I said, because people... Again, it's my, it's my intuition. I don't have facts. I, don't, I can't prove it. But my intuition is that people will, uh, will forget what is really happening in the database. People will start getting away from this territory. They will, because these DTOs will make their life easier for, for simple cases. Because, of course, if you say, get, my, get movie from the database and you get the DTO, without thinking how to write the SQL, select something, you need to remember the name of the table, you need to remember how to join together other tables. You just say, get me the, the movie by the ID. So you get lazy. You become lazy, you start forgetting what's going on in the database. And when you start forgetting, it will be difficult for you when the situation is necessary, when the situation will require you to really understand the SQL. You will not be able to do it. You will, always, you will only think about DTOs, you will only think in terms of this entity management, and when it's going to be necessary to write the query like this, you will be uh, without the tools, you will, for, you will forget how to do it. And, 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 then, and then when you write it, you will need some database administrators, some database experts. And I see this, and I saw that a number of times in large projects, when we have programmers who write the code, and then when it's necessary to write a query, they call somebody else. They call the guy who understands databases. And then the guy comes in and says, okay, in this query, you need to do this, this, and this in order to make it work fast. And that's only sad to see because programmers, they need to understand how to deal with the relational data, not just rely on some guy who, who doesn't know objects. So you need to know both domains and not mix them like this, but keep them separate. This is one domain, this is another one. That's... That's my intuition. Of course, it's difficult to prove it with the facts. I cannot say like, you know, we know that programmers make more mistakes when I don't have this information. But my personal feeling for the, I don't know, many years of programming tells me that uh, the code will look uh, less maintainable if you, uh, if you, in general, let me finish this lecture with this claim that in general, the more magic your code has, and by magic I mean these annotations, like you remember this entity manager I showed you, like movie, and then the annotations. The annotation says, this is actually the movie table in the database. How this annotation is being interpreted by the entity manager, it's a magic. So you don't see how it happens. It happens behind the scene. So you give some request to the entity manager, and the entity manager deals with your object some way which you don't see. You cannot click the button and get to the line which injects the data into your object, or which retrieves the data from the database. It happens behind the scene. Some people believe it's good. Some people say it's nice, because I only put the annotation. I just annotate my, my class, and I say, this class corresponds to the movie in the database. Fill it up with data. Do it for me. Boom, the data gets in. They say, I don't want to know how it happens. I don't care. I just want to continue programming. I believe it's wrong. I believe this magic only hurts the maintainability. I want, as a programmer, to always be able to click on the method and go deeper, go deeper, click by click, down to the line which actually goes to the database. If I cannot do it, click, 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 click. If I cannot just traverse the code down to the very, very line which makes the actual request to the, to the file, to the database, whatever, if this traceability is not present, it's bad. But the common trend in the industry is the opposite, especially in Java world. They love magic. They love these annotations, they attach it everywhere, and then there's some magic, magic, magic structures like data, like continuous dependency injector, con dependency injection container, uh, the, the spring loader, the, the JPA loader, all of these guys, they work behind the scenes, so you don't see them. You just annotate your objects, you run the application, and magically, your objects get data. The data gets injected into your objects, which are not objects in my opinion at all, and this is wrong. This magic is counterintuitive. It only makes the programmer uh, out of control. So we control less, less, and less. And in the end, we just become monkeys who can only remember, okay, put the annotation there and hope for the best. It works? Great. It doesn't work? I don't know what to do. Something is wrong with my annotation. Let's copy the example from Stack Overflow. The annotation, ah, you put the annotation in the wrong position. Wow. 
God bless the, the writer of the Stack Overflow. I change the positions. Wow, it works. Magic. Amazing. I'm a good programmer. No, you're not a good programmer. You just found the right trick. But the good programmer just click down, 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 understands what happens, and rewrite the code so it works. But bad programmers, they, they do tricks. They just try to trick the computer so eventually it works, and, and then don't touch it. Let it work. We don't want to be that kind of programmers.